Before we get into the theme of today, I want to do uh, unashamedly uh, a little take a moment to reflect on uh, Swoboda Research Centre. Um, we have been going since 2017. Uh, many of the people in this room were either in Ralph's kitchen in, uh, in, in 2016 when we started to think about this in, in Ballsbridge in Dublin, uh, or have been in some of the meetings that we had over the following 18 months. I think we had a group of people in the Friends Meeting House uh, in Manchester in, uh, in January 2017 uh, to get where British Credit Unions came. Um, so you've been on this journey. And what we've built together over that period of time is, um, you know, we now have a research since it's published 40 publications. Uh, we have involved in that process 30-odd authors. Um, Paul and I are probably involved in half of those papers, either authoring them ourselves or co-authoring. Um, we've, uh, we've delivered, a we've, we've sponsored uh, a bunch of podcasts. Many of you will listen to uh, Chris Smith's Talking Credit Unions podcast series. If you don't listen to Chris Smith's Credit Union podcast series, you should. Um, I was talking to um, somebody here, who I, won't, I won't name, but he said, who's relatively new to the sector. He said he'd listened to 20 in the previous few weeks, and it really helped him get to grips with uh, the credit union movement. So I, I recommend those wholeheartedly. Um, we've put on 10 conferences. This is our 10th. Uh, we obviously had to go online during COVID, uh, and that wasn't uh, without its hairy, scary moments. But we have managed to bring credit unionists and stakeholders together uh, 10 times since 2018, and, and we're very proud of that. And uh, this, you know, long may it continue. Um, and we now have 60 members uh, from credit unions and five corporate credit unions. Uh, and uh, you know, we're delighted for that with that support. And I just, we, we, we've, got to we've come a long way in those few years. So um, thank you who've come with us. And I hope you feel that this has been uh, a positive, cooperative journey. We have collaborated. If we didn't do this, if you guys didn't, put money in the pot and help us with the research, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen because it's not a, the private sector is not interested in doing this. Um, so as, as we've now sort of maturing a bit at Swoboda, um, we've been taking stock this year. We've got a few new, um, we have a board, um, you may or may not know that, but um, we have a board of great people, chief executives and CFOs and a chair of credit unions in Britain and Ireland. And they've been doing some work with us in the last few months uh, just to do a quick recap as to whether the original um, objectives we set ourselves are what we're still about. So um, we have um, just tweaked our vision and mission and values, and uh, I'm going to share them with you just because I think, I think it's important. We want your support with this, and, uh, and we want you to share our vision. Um, we, um, our vision, I don't know off by heart yet, um, is to be the leading research organization for Irish, British, and European credit unions and their stakeholders. And our mission is to support positive change and transformation in the credit union movement by providing action-orientated, sector-leading research and events. And our values are cooperation, uh, professionalism, and independence, which we hope is something we bring, uh, independence of thought and independence of approach to uh, stimulate and assist you with your thinking about your organizations. So that's where um, 2023, we think we've built some momentum and we've got a clear vision for where we're trying to get to. So with that in mind, next year, uh, early next year, I was gonna make specific date promises, but it's always, I don't wanna pin myself down. We're going to uh, refresh the membership packages uh, for credit unions. Um, we want to make it simpler. We want to make the business case for joining Swoboda kind of crystal clear. Uh, why wouldn't you? Uh, because we want more members. We want more members because well, the support we receive from you is fantastic, but we, need, we want more because then we can do more. Um, we'll be able to do more research, different types of research, particularly quantitative research, which we aren't able to do lots of at the moment. We need analysts to get into the skin of that stuff. So. Um, we will be keen for you to tell your friends, to uh, persuade them, twist their arms, and get them involved as well. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, and just to remind that some, some of you will know, Ralph Swoboda was involved in the, who was our original chair and co-founder. Um, he was involved in setting up of 
Filene in, Euro, in, in the USA uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, which is a massive research centre funded by credit unions, for credit unions. And Ralph was always keen that Europe should have a Filene. So, you know, we feel that, there's a, that we, we have a role and we hope that you agree with that and we want to get more credit unions involved. So, after that shameless plug, um, let's talk a little bit about what we're, what we're doing today, why are we here. Um, so, the, the, uh, the right-hand side is supposed to be a QR code that would take you straight to the programme, uh, but as many of you will have found, it doesn't. Uh, but it, uh, I'd like to say it was deliberate, but it's not. It takes you to our website. If you go to the homepage of our website, there is a post on the homepage called Conference Programme. And if you go onto that post, there is a link in there which opens the programme. So in there, you will get the details of the agenda and the biographies of the speakers and that kind of thing. And the attendance list, you can see who else is here. Um, otherwise, the agenda is also on the wall by the door there. So you can, you can check it out. But um, what we're... What we're what we wanted to explore today is, is to try and get our minds up, our eyes up and head looking out, looking at the future. And just some, uh, th and some things, observations from me about where I see some of these things going, which may or may not you know, come up in the conversation because we have a bunch of experts who I'll talk about in a minute come to talk about this, and those experts include you. Um, but some things I would like to put out there will be about where, our, where the way we work is going to be or the expectations of our members in a few years' time. So one of the things is I expect that we will, I will be expecting as a consumer that my um, organization is, uh, everything is real time. I don't have to wait for stuff. I could, dis I could get a loan for 24 hours. I could, do, I could get some interest on my savings over 24 hours. I can get stuff like that. I could even get a, maybe a loan for a morning if I need to. I can, um, you know, those kind of, the facility, my, I could break up my mortgage payments through the month. That's what I'll be expecting from my financial service providers in the next few years, because they'll be able to cope with that. Um, I think um, I will be expecting it to be always on everywhere. We're closed on Wednesday afternoons for training. Won't work for me in a few years' time. Um, I will want other ways of accessing my money, accessing services. I will be expecting somebody who may even be artificial to respond to my requirements and be able to address quite a lot of the basic ones in particular. Um, I want, it, I want it to be personal. I'll be expecting it to be tailored to me. I'll be expecting when I apply for a loan for the, for the response to be, well, um, yes, absolutely, Nick, but have you thought about using that savings pot you don't seem to have touched for two or three years? Because the, we will be using data to connect that stuff up, to actually understand that it's me applying, not just you know, one generic person who looks like a lot like everyone else. And uh, I think it'll be predictive. So I will be getting messages saying, Nick, you haven't set up your Christmas savings account this year. We're already, you know, we're in June now. You usually set it up in April. Do you want to do that? And that won't be a message that's going to all members at the same time. It'll be going to me because you know that I usually do this and you're able to assess it and pick up my, me, my needs. So this is a, quite a different world, I think, from the one we've been in. And, and I think, uh, and, I, and I may be wrong, but what, what we want from today is to hear what your thoughts are and for you to hear from some people who've already got some thoughts on this, developed some thoughts on it. So uh, a real welcome to our speakers and panellists who are here. They're also on your agenda. Um, so I won't go, they'll be introducing themselves and introduced later, but I won't go into them. But we're really delighted that all, those pe all these people have come to participate and offer, offer you something today. Um, big thank you to our corporate members. Um, these, these, these organisations are organisations that want to support the work of Svoboda because they support credit unions and they, they see the value of research to their customers. Um, so it's, uh, we get in-kind support or cash support from those, those organisations and that enables us to put on events like this. So thank you very much to those organisations. Uh, as one, by the way, which is our um, British corporate uh, member, I have a little stand out there. Simon's out there if you'd like to talk to him. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Unity Trust Bank who guys who are out there as well and, and, and probably in the hall to, during the sessions. Um, so do talk to them. We're very grateful for them uh, taking a stand with us today. So before we get into the meat of the conversation, um, I wanted to do something silly. So I thought, why not put a picture of, of uh, Friedrich Engels next to Donald Rumsfeld? 
uh, because that does seem a pretty silly thing. Obviously, obviously Engel, uh, Engel's on the left and Rumsfeld's on the right. I didn't have a slide big enough because they probably should have been over there and over there. But um, why are these guys here? Well, the first thing is, um, so that, uh, he, he is just around the corner. So if any of you have got time today, uh, you go around the back of the hotel, uh, Eng big statue of Engels, because as many of you will know, he wrote his book about the condition of the English working classes in the 1840s. And a lot of it was focused on an area that used to be called Little Ireland, which is about 400 yards, 500 yards that way, which was about, and it was about the terrible conditions people were living in at the time. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a rollicking read, but you know, if any of you are historically minded, it's quite interesting. <laughs> Engels has nothing to say about the digital future. <laughs> he said a lot about how he thought the world was going to evolve and in collaboration with Karl Marx and Sessio, they came up with a whole system, a predictive system about the world, where the world would work. <coughs> 120 years, he died 125, 30 years ago. He had nothing to say about this digital world. He wouldn't have any conception of it. And I think, so we, we, we get, I guess the point there is just the extent to which we can't see very far, which is why I want to mention Rumsfeld, because many of you will know Rumsfeld famously talked about Known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And what I think we're going to be talking about today is some things that are some known unknowns. We don't quite know where our AI is going to go. We don't quite know how data is going to be used. We don't know what the two or three next steps are on chat GPT. And we're going to hear from some, uh, some of our experts, their, some of their thoughts on where this might go. But we don't know it yet. We just have a sense of the things that are going to be part of that, the thing, the experiences that I talked about earlier. But there's a lot of unknown unknowns, and we just need to be mindful that that's going to be out there, and, and that's why we have to keep having events like this, because at some, each of us in an event like this, sometimes something clicks, a light bulb clicks, and a thing that was unknown unknown suddenly becomes a, oh, right, huh, now I realise what I don't understand. So that's part of today as well, and I'm going to stop now. So um, I'm going to hand over to um, Karen Elliott from Birmingham University. Um, or is it the University of Birmingham, Karen? Which way around? The University of Birmingham. The University of Birmingham. That's a logo. Okay, okay, yeah. sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so that's a good start, isn't it? So, um, I'm delighted to welcome Karen, who's got, uh, who's got, who's got fingers in a, in a range of really exciting fintech and academic research pies. Um, we didn't get to talk about that project, the, um, the research funding you talked about. No, I'm going to do some. You're going to look at the end. Oh, great, yeah. great. Okay, fantastic. I need, I need a clicker. You do need the clicker, and I need to switch you to your slides. So just a sec. Thank you. So um, welcome, Karen. Thank you. OK. So thanks for asking me to be here. And a little bit of background about me. I call myself a pracademic for two reasons. One, I started life at 16 in industry. I went into project and then program management uh, by the time I was in my late 20s and worked on a range of projects, including finance, pensions, um, asset management, etc., mergers and acquisitions, but also around education. So I'll, I'll come back to that <laughs> later. And the reason I'm in fintech and finance is I'm very interested in this physical and digital. So when I transitioned out of industry after 20 years and went to Durham University, and you can ask me why later, um, I, I, I studied behavioral psychology and sociology on implementing policy change amongst a diverse group of, of stakeholders and looking at the vested interests and the behaviours around different groups coming together and how they would collaborate to actually um, work together to, to make good stuff happen. So I'm very interested in good stuff. And then I got interested in Bitcoin and blockchain, which is something probably alien to you about 10 years ago when I was at Durham University. And the interest for me was about the power dynamic because potentially, in essence, it had the potential to disrupt the current financial system across the world as it was. In theory, you wouldn't need lawyers because it's immutable, which means it can't be changed because of the encryption. Um, but, and that made it trustworthy. And therefore, we wouldn't need banks, lawyers, regulators, because we could regulate ourselves. Now, that would be very scary to a lot of people in finance. And from my position as a behavioral psychologist and um, sociologist, it's like, it's never going to happen because of the power dynamics. And this is what we're seeing as well in the digital era as that's starting to come in. So I focus on fintech, but particularly around financial inclusion 
giving voice to those who really don't have a voice at the table. And that, like most things, came out of personal experience in that my mother has dementia. And in lockdown, it was writ large to me that she couldn't actually function and have a voice or transact financially because she couldn't do digital. Um, they set up a password is my voice, but I was in the background going, my password is my voice. And they could hear me. So of course, because of security reasons, sorry, um, security reasons, they were saying, we can't do this. Your only option is to go down lasting powers of her attorney. So that got me thinking, well, if there's lots of people with dementia out there that don't have a me who can get a, a lasting power of attorney, can understand all the legal jargon, can fill out the forms, pay for it, and send it off to everybody who needs it, what happens to people like that? And that led to a long story, and one of the reasons why I'm here today looking at what are the pieces of the puzzle in financial inclusion that this physical, digital divide can we actually try to, I'm not going to say level up, but kind of, can we level up and kind of bring together in a meaningful way? So for me, with credit unions as well, it starts and ends with people, but this is also meaningful to me in the tech world because I feel that it starts and ends with people too. So all the students that I work with that are machine learning engineers and doing AI now, we're now teaching them to think about the ethical questions up front, about what are you building for whom? Is it the right tool for the problem that's coming up? And I want you to think about the critical questions to avoid the unintended consequences of what you're doing later on. So this includes, as you'll have heard, the bias, et cetera. And what Nick was talking about, that I will want everything on demand, is good, but it also comes with risks, which I'll leave for leader to discuss around the technical side. So I also focus on data ethics and governance and something called corporate digital responsibility, which I'm not going to touch too much on today, but you can ask me about it later. Okay, so I'm with you that what you do starts and ends with people. And as a sociologist, I'm very interested in what happens to people and also this technological journey. Now, we're not going to be able to get rid of it. ChatGPT is here. My students are using it, thinking they can cheat. Not really. But, you know, there is iterations of that, but it also hallucinates. So what it does, it's like a child. You give it plasticity and say, build a man. It comes back like it has a head and some arms. and goes, ah, There you go. So some of the information it's producing is not great. It is phenomenal if you ask it to do, um, as I was talking last night with some colleagues, if you ask it to do an overview or a, a marketing presentation, great. But when you get into something that's more cognitively challenging, to be exact, no. I actually asked it to run various things like, who are the leading academics in this area? And I knew they weren't at the universities that it brought up. So it's very interesting. Anyway. This is the era that you're in, and you've got to face a digital transformation, which also starts and ends with people. Because if you don't get people to understand what is in it for them at the basic level to engage and change and push out of our comfort zones, does the digital era push you out of your comfort zone right now? If you can show your hands. Does it make you feel uncomfortable because you're perhaps in the Rumsfeld era of it's an unknown unknown? Is anyone in that era? Put your hands up if you feel like that. Okay, we'll get to the honesty bit later. Um, but anyway, we've all probably got children or relatives who, you know, are digital natives and go, oh, for God's sake. You know, it's this. Just use the app, do that. But there is a lot of people as well, particularly the credit union cohort, that are not in that space, that are excluded, and no one seems to care. I get asked a lot to go and speak at multiple fintech um, conferences, big ones. I was in New York, I believe, presenting to the Bank of America. And I said, I'm sick of standing here talking about, and you're going, yes, yes, oh, we care, we care about financial inclusion, yes, whatever you want, Karen. And then you come and go, can you give me some funding to help do something in communities? Well, um, maybe that's on next year's agenda. But we'll write it in our PR that we're doing financial inclusion, and fintech has the potential to make everything more inclusive. Now, the tech does have some pros and cons to it, which leader will talk about later, and it can lead a way to helping it use it, but it has to have critical questions asked up first. How are we going to use it? How are we going to get our members to use it? And I have a declaration that I do 
with leader independent advice in Kutu who are using open banking APIs to broaden that. But that's not to say that we're not open to looking at other perspectives and saying, how can we work this out together? Because no one person has the answer to this. It's changing very fast. It's a very fluid space. There's developments going on in Silicon Valley that we don't even know are not governed and, not, and then they just pop up like they did a couple of weeks ago. Now we're doing multimodal AI. We've been developing this for a year. Oh, thanks guys. You know, could you just sort of shared that a little bit and we could have had a discussion and help no because there's this old dichotomy of profit versus purpose and still at the moment I would argue that profit still outweighs the purpose when you're trying to do technological developments I've advised many startups and they, if they want an exit strategy before they've even developed their product and see if it works without even thinking about the cohorts who are not able to use it yet so my focus is very on the voice that is not on the table how do we look and get this diverse input? So you'll have all have heard of bias in AI, I presume. And that is caused primarily because most of the developers still are white, male, middle class, developing what they know. I work with a professor who is head of our computer science, and he won't hate me for saying this, but he said, you know, I'm six foot four, white, Dutch male, and I have built tech in the past by what I know. And this then, as you can imagine, stretches out to all the examples I won't relay. But this is why we need the technology. It is not entirely bad, but we have to have this human in the loop, which is you guys, to help bring us into the digital era so that we can get to the position that Nick was talking about, but we can do it safely and work together. And that's why we're going to set you a few challenging questions today. So this is what we want to do. We want to raise awareness. We want to tip so we have digital and financial democracy. But what we're in a situation now is when I go and talk to someone, they go, credit unions? It's like, it's like um, in academia where there's funding. It's a best kept secret. I'm going, they're brilliant. They have a really good role to play. But then people go, well, well, well how, how do we get people to know this? And how do we get access to them? And it's still not clear to a lot of people in the broader system about where they would go if they needed a small, responsible loan that they could then pay back at their rate. It's still not quite getting there. So we've got, we've got a challenge around that. And also, back to Karl Marx, since we already had angles. Um, seen as a sociologist. I like Karl Marx. I am not an armchair Marxist, but I do like some of his ideas. And at the moment, these are two key, two key areas that I'm focusing on, the human beings and the nature. So of course, you all know about ESG and the UN directives. That also feeds into, I'm asking and challenging the bigger financial corporations, what are you doing around your S and your G? Because I don't see a lot of it. And to me, this is where financial inclusion sits under the S and the G, giving back to the social, helping to, you know, pass forward, pay it forward, the benefits and profits that they're getting down to the sector. So, Mr. Loan Shark, okay, you all be aware of Mr. Loan Shark, and, and I hate the statistics around this, it really gets me annoyed that people are having to go without things to actually repay back to these people when they're paying gazillion percent, and I'm not telling you something you don't already know, but what these guys are doing is they are, as most criminals are, five steps ahead when it comes to the digital tools they can use to manipulate and be the friend of the consumer to get in there. So they're using Facebook, they're using the community channels to go, you want a loan? I can be your friend. Mr. Loan Shark is there. And this is the gap that I want you to fill in. So why has Mr. Loan Shark come to being? Any guesses? Why is he now more prevalent? Mm -hmm. But... We have a wicked problem because a wicked problem is that the solution is worse than the original situation. What was that? The removal of payday lending. Although it's unscrupulous and it had ethical problems around it, it has opened up the gap for Mr. Shark because nothing came in to fill that space around the awareness gap of where do I get money quickly when I need it. So this is the definition of a wicked problem. And I always make go back to the, when I was studying this at Durham University saying what is a wicked problem my son was fairly young and he was going it's wicked and I was like not that type of wicked no it's wicked is that, that it's very difficult to define and it's very difficult to resolve in fact you can't resolve it you have to manage it iteratively and take it challenge by challenge just to do a little bit better 
And I noticed in George books uh, last night, he has a similar diagram about design thinking. And this is exactly it. We need to ask, what are the wicked problems that we're having in um, the credit union space around the digital that needs to take to a new level. Now I know I've read online that in Ireland there's a lot of movement around the digital. We have Incuta, we have other solutions, but it's a little bit fragmented, which is it, which is a kind of a mirror image of what's happening in, in the broader financial service as well. There's different people doing lots of great things, but it's not all coming together to actually solve some of these bigger wicked problems because we've got the profit versus purpose um, problem until we come to reporting ESG, which just gets washed. So these are why we are in this state of having a wicked problem. So today, what we're going to focus on, with the help of George and others, are these wicked problems. How do we get around them? How do we pass and share knowledge and data in a safe manner, which we can do under GDPR, to actually benefit our customers to get to the status that Nick talked about, where it'll be on demand digitally, but we need to do a financial literacy angle, we need to do a digital angle as well, not saying that they don't know anything, but just filling in the gaps. And there's lots of companies working around then, but guess what, it's fragmented, it needs to be pulled together. So like I say, we're in the digital era, and this causes an issue for you in getting in that mindset that we can't just automate what we've always done we need to stretch beyond and i know probably some of you are sitting there with folded arms thinking well she's teaching me to suck eggs here we're already down that road we are but there's more that we can do and Lida will be covering more about her experience and what she can do technologically and we can't deny we're in it chat gpt it is different. We're also moving into the era of, I say, multimodal AI, which is looking at different types of data, whether video, art, pictures, written word, and how do we cut across the silos and use the AI? So that's like the next stage, the Gemini that I referred to that Google had just announced, they've been working on it for a year. And that again is going to kick off another raft of changes across what we can do in AI. There is this this caveat that AI is, is not quite as sophisticated as we like to think it is, with this scaring between the utopian and the dystopian future, Terminator's over just around the corner, not really. Um, he's not gonna be that, that for quite a while. It hasn't got that sentient being yet, but there are people working on these large language models, natural language processing, uh, programming, et cetera, and seeing how we can push the barriers. So these are things that we need to be aware of. What do they mean? What are the risks? Because when you're looking at governance, it's technically a risk to your business if you get it wrong, who's culpable? So this is what I say, risk assessment comes a lot. And, and Lida will talk about this in the banking. When you think about in finance, it's predominantly about risk assessment. And I used to be a risk manager when I was in industry. So one of the first things I did when encountering machine learning and AI was going, okay, so we've got the deep learning with the black box. We don't really fully understand how we get from A to B at the deep learning level, but we put parameters around it of acceptability in engineering terms and go, we've ticked that box, we're happy with that. So then we take it up to the training level in machine learning. We get some data. We don't really fully check for the bias, but we're starting to. And then we split it and we have a training set and we have a data set where we tell it how to learn. And then we have another set and then put it out into the wild to see if it's confirming back to us that that is an acceptable level and output that we get. And then we aggregate it up to the A level, which has learning capacity, and then poof, it goes out into the ether. And I was going, whoa, 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 risk, risk assessment. It's going, what's happening here? Does anybody actually check that once it's out there in the ether, that it's learning in the manner that it was expected to do? What if someone takes a bit of open source data and code and changes it slightly and then uses it and it does something that causes an, an online harm or an unintended consequence? Who is culpable? So I started working with lawyers to say, okay, several scenarios, use cases, what happens legally because I'm not a lawyer. And the space, as you would understand, is messy and wicked and it's complicated. And we've got the EU and the UK and the US working around how do we do put policy in place. But I mean, for instance, with the EU, you as, as an owner of the AI have to categorize it low, medium or high risk. Which category do you think is going to be most popular? Low. Low to medium, I doubt anybody's going to go, yeah, mine is a high-risk AI, it's going to do a lot of unintended damage to everybody. No, it's not going to happen. People, humans, are conservative with the truth when they've got a lot of other people resting on this being a success. So we've got a long way to go in risk assessment, 
but also when you're embarking on your journey or digital transformation, you will get pain points. There are being pain points around, you know, do your customers want this? Yes, they want the human in the loop. So how do we come up with this hybrid system that works for you as providers, but also meets the consumer, putting it on demand, as Nick said, but also in a safe and ethical manner, and tick your ESG box at the same time. You have a lot to contend with, okay? It's an untenable position to wrap around. So we need to sort of back it up and take steps Different people will be at different technological readiness levels within the organization, but also in terms of your consumer. So this is why we go back to where do the credit union sit? Now, I would imagine that you're all at different technological readiness levels. If we did like a quick audit and said, okay, where would you gauge yourself in terms of being able to go? How, how long do you anticipate it would be before you could you could provide what Nick's scenario was. How many years would you see that? Do you think you could turn that around quick, quickly? Is anybody confident enough to predict how long it would take them to get to the on-demand making decisions around credit and loans? Anybody want to dare put their hat in the ring? In an estimate? No? Is that one at the back or are you just moving your arm? Just moving around. So yeah, it's it's a journey, and we've got to see it as an iterative process. But during that journey, lots of things have changed. I know since I got into this area, it has gone from here to here pretty quickly, but there's also been bumps in the road. And therefore, for credit unions, you've got the opportunity, which leader's going to talk about, is the cost to serve has come down. What you've been used to in terms of technological infrastructure, and let's face it, it was mentioned last night that, that JP Morgan investor was a 15 million a year or 15 billion a year in technology but as leader will tell you the banking infrastructure is still not good we need COBOL programmers who are now dying off to come back and sort out the mainframe because it's not fit for purpose it can't talk but what you've got in in this current era is you can build from scratch you can you can start to work with the technology companies who are more, more agile and can build you purpose bespoke responses because it's now cheaper to serve and get the cost down, which leader will talk a bit more about. So that's what we want to challenge you with. So you, this is what you've got when you're working with, with your, your credit unions. You've got an interaction level, which may be human, may be digital, may be an AI bot um, in the future. We've also got the journey level. You've got to take your consumers with you. And these are where all the different pain points are. You probably can't see that that well, but I put physical and digital pain points to the green circles here. And then you still want to keep that relationship with your, your customers, but also the regulator with other credit unions to learn from each other as well. We sometimes get inwardly focused and because sometimes it's like you want to be more competitive, you want to be the best leading, we forget and a vested interest pops up, which is ordinary for human nature as a psychologist, okay? We're always looking at what's in it for me, how, how do I push this forward and then I might collaborate when I'm happy to collaborate. But we need to try and break those barriers a bit and you might go, oh, yeah, that's very nice, Karen, all very nice. But why not be the first kind of step across that and make a difference? and try to break them down. So this is just something you might see as well. The ecosystem that you're in at the moment, you have the digital infrastructure, which I just talked about, tends to be a little bit hidden from you, and you're kind of going, I, I kind of get stuff from like hand-me-downs, like when you were a kid, you know, you got your elder siblings' clothes, and they kind of get them, they don't really fit. And Lida's gonna talk a bit more about that. And in the middle, you're kind of struggling about what can we do that's bespoke, that's not too expensive, we can't afford JP Morgan's budget, no way. Um, and then we've also got this offering at the top. We've got different sectoral platforms, which we might look at and go, that would be nice to have. And we're getting to the era in digital where we can possibly start to pull these together and get companies who can build them for the fraction of the cost. Because the machine learning, AI, and coding and programming is advancing to a level that my students are building platforms now for next to nothing. So this is where we're going and we've got companies who can actually leverage it. Again, I'm not going to steal Lida's thunder. I'll let her do more on the technological side in banking. And so we're back to the wicked problem. We've got a wicked problem, but a wicked problem is not just technological. It's also human because we have to look at ourselves. We have a dark side of psychology. We all know, I mean, if you think in the digital era, has anybody heard of Ethereum in the Bitcoin world? Yeah, the Ethereum platform set up by a, grou a group of venture capitalists. They all went in, they all put money in, and all of a sudden one of them went, if I just take out 32 million 
Am I breaking the rules? And that, for everybody who's got children, reminding you, like, don't touch that. Don't, don't. They do it, right? It's human. It's hot-wired into us to be curious creatures. And research is all about being curious. I think George has got that in his book as well. And this is where we can start and work together and collaborate and see what are the pain points along that journey that I put before? What can we actually look? What is a wicked problem for you right now? Is it understanding machine learning? Is it that you don't have a resource for a machine learning engineer? I'm going to plug in a minute where you can fill that gap. Do I need to speak to someone about the data ethics? But I haven't got resource for that. I've also got a solution for that as well. Where we can collaborate and come together and start to fill this space. Now, it sounds very twee, but let's collaborate. Let's all play nicely after what I've just said about human nature. But it is the only way that we're going to get forward to look at the different parts of the puzzle in the financial inclusion space, of which you have got a massive role to get rid of Mr. Shark because he's starting to grow and infiltrate because we need to raise the awareness of what we can do. But we also have this digital journey and transformation, which is human and digital to go through. Now, the ceremonious plug is I'm a director of what's called the UK Fin Network Plus, and I'll give details to Nick, my bad for not putting it on the slides. And what that is, is funding from the research councils to pay for an academic's time to work with you on R&D projects. So what that means, if you've got a gap in the knowledge, say, around machine learning, how do I build a machine learning algorithm? How do they then use AI? Is AI the right tool for me? I'm not quite sure. This is where you can buy the time of an academic in that field from a, a university across the UK, any university, it can be Manchester, it can be Edinburgh, it can be um, Imperial College London, it can be in Ireland, we also reach out and cover Ireland. And we have agile projects running all the time to do an MVP, so minimum viable product. Um, for £10,000, you can apply now and get a response in two weeks to turn it around. If you don't have an academic, because I see the face of that, I don't know any academics. Okay, I'm dragging the academics with me to say, you need to work. You need to work with, with um, academics and industry a bit more. So this is a way of getting us together. You pay for our time, which would all, ordinarily would be an extra resource to you. You're getting it free because the research council will cover that. You apply, there are forms, mm, sorry, like everything, there's admin to do because we have to apply for the money, but you get that resource technically for free to fill, to fill the gap to help you tackle some of these wicked problems. Now it goes up from there in technological readiness stages. So as you progress through those levels, you can then do a pilot study for about 25K, a feasibility study for 100K. So you probably buy a year's worth of academic resource for that. Okay, so that's my ceremonious plug. You can reach me later because I think I'm probably running over time and I need to pass over to Lida. But what I want to challenge you is think about your wicked problems. Think about breaking down the barriers because the credit unions have a huge role to play in bringing this digital divide a little bit further up and we can't ignore um, with the role of digital. What you do starts and ends with people. Digital also starts and ends with people. But we have to get that diversity of thinking at the front end to actually train the machine learning and the AI to do better stuff and to be bespoke to what you need, not something that you're just going to get open source that doesn't really do the job. And the funding there is to help you do that. So I'm challenging you, along with everything else today, to think about that. And I'll give, give Nick all the details. OK, so thanks for listening. I'll pass you over to Lida. Thanks very much, Karen. That's fantastic. Um, just to say that at the Swoboda Centre, we do know some academics. So uh, we think this could be quite an exciting way for us to uh, access some funding. So we, and we can help you with some of the burden of, of doing both project management, finding people, and that kind of thing. So if you are interested in picking up uh, on what Karen's just talked about, um, then you know, talk to us and, and we'll see if we can help because we'd really like to get involved in that. Now, um, there's going to be a brief, uh, a brief pause because I've now, um, unfortunately, Leader's not able to uh, join us in person today um, for personal reasons. So, but she's very kindly um, coming down the line on a Zoom, on, on Zoom. Um, so that's going to uh, test my tech skills now. Uh, <laughs> So if we can have a moment of quiet and prayer from you about me, um, and I will get Leader up on the screen. Okay, so um, we've successfully got a face on the screen. So that's good news. 
Um, so, uh, just we're just going to test the sound briefly. So, Leader, could you say hello to everybody? Hi, everybody. Can you hear? Can you hear Leader at the back? You can. Great. Good. Okay. So, um, I'm very, very briefly just going to say, Leader, Leader's got an interesting uh, background um, in in banking and is now independent. She's written, and I'm not going to go into that. She'll tell you a bit more about herself. But just to say, you might see over her shoulder, her left shoulder. Um, I'm pointing at it, Leader, you can't see that, but I'm pointing at a book called Bankers Like Us. Uh, and Bankers Like Us is a bit of a manifesto from Leader for how the banking industry needs to wise up to becoming socially valuable. Uh, and it's aimed really at bank. It's the kind of book that should make people in this room feel a little smug, but uh, it, nevertheless, it has a range of challenges in there for us as well. Um, so Leader's got a stack of uh, experience in tech and banking, uh, which she's very kindly going to share some of with us today. Um, I know she would have liked to be with us. Her contact detail, her email address is in the bios section of the program, and she's um, very keen to hear from anybody who wants to follow up on a conversation, uh, and maybe we'll get her back to a, a Swoboda event in due course. So I'm uh, going to... Le uh, Lida can hear us, but she can't see us. So we're going to... Um, Lida's going to present for a little while, and then we're going to try and do a and a um, a br short Q&A before we then go into a panel session. Um, so, um, over to you, Leader. Thank you very much for that. Can someone um, cheers when you see my screen? Yay. Can you see it? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. First of all, huge apology that I can't be there uh, with you. As as Nick said, some family matters have uh, have um, um, come up, and I am hugely thankful for how flexible uh, Nick and the team have been. Because I was very very keen to be here with you today. I won't be able to be there in person, but I'm there in spirit, um, and I hope that I will have some questions from you either after this or as you digest everything that has happened um, offline. I am more than happy to pick up an email or a call. As Nick said, I, I have a, a long journey in this space. I have worked in technology transformation and financial services for 20 years. I started this work before digital was a thing um, and have worked with organizations of all sizes, but mostly pretty large corporates on the challenges and mission um, and, and costs and risks of, of technology transformation. And the reality is that... Um, the technical challenges that you're faced with are exactly the same as the technical challenges everyone else is faced with. There are two differences, um, I would I would think, are two differences I'd like to talk about with you today. One is that you have a different mission, and that is really, really important to remember and bring into the conversation. And the second is that the way you consume technology is different. So I know that there are uh, organizations of various sizes in the room right now. Uh, but have a think and tell me if any of this rings a bell. I would guess that every single one of you is using technology that wasn't built for you. I have this conversation with credit unions the world over. Some of the biggest credit unions in the world in North America would agree that the technology they're using was not built for them. That becomes even more of um, uh, even more the case when you you're talking about a more um, specialist smaller or more regional credit union. The reality is the vast majority of systems that you're called upon to choose between were not designed for you. They were not designed for your needs. They were not um, they didn't start with you as a starting point. And that means that most of it, if not all of it, will probably be too big for you. And that's not exactly a technical term, but I'm guessing you know exactly what I mean. There will be a lot of functionality there that you get, but you don't need. There will be a lot of configuration there that is needed, but doesn't actually have an obvious upside. There'll be a lot of heaviness, a lot of complexity, a lot of stuff that doesn't necessarily solve any problem for you, but you have no choice other than to take it because that's the only solution in the market. And the choice between providers tends to actually not be very much of a choice in terms of what is fit for purpose. And the reality of all that is that because these solutions have been built with someone else primarily in mind, someone else is a better customer, not because they're better behaved or more valuable in uh, ethical terms, but because they're more valuable in monetary terms. 
I had a very rude awakening in that um, in that regard myself when I moved from working in technology for the biggest custodian in the world to moving to a regional bank. I, my job got bigger. The size of the bank I was representing in vendor negotiations got a lot smaller. The very same people that I had a relationship with already, they still liked me, but they took my call with a different degree of intensity. So the reality is across the credit union world, actually I would say across the mutuals world, the technology we're using is not designed for us. It's probably a bit too big. And the attention and help we need from vendors isn't always forthcoming because this space is not where they make most of their money. Um, I was speaking with a core banking vendor because that's a lot of my background about this space. And I said, well, where do you bucket credit unions? And he said, tier six, irrespective of size. Now that's terrible. That is terrible because technology is how we do the work. But the reality is if we accept that most of what we use is not built for us, it's too big for us. And the people that we're dealing with have more important people to be talking to, there is a little bit of a feeling that we're kind of being left behind in that amazing magical technology revolution that Karen was talking about. Because the reality is we're living through one of the most creative eras in human history in terms of technology advancement. And you can talk about chat GPT and generative AI at home, but you're still gonna be doing things manually or on a spreadsheet or in a system that is older than me at work. That doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right to have chat GPT on your phone and technology from 30 years ago at work. Incidentally, every single image in this presentation has been created by AI. It has been created on a um, professional version of uh, Leonardo AI. You know how easy it was? Four clicks of a button per image. You know how cheap it was? The professional... Um, uh, registration is about $130 for the year. Why is that important? Because actually the accessibility of new technology is there. We're just not benefiting from it. And the things I want to talk to you about today is actually not AI at all. It's how I get to consume this AI. The API connectivity between the Leonardo uh, wizardry engine that creates these images and the way it's delivered to me. Because for your benefits, the most important thing to remember is that we live in a time that has been working out for the last 15 years how to deliver information that is personalized, specific, cheap, in a quick and secure way. You may not know how Leonardo created this image. I have no idea how Leonardo created this image but I know a lot about how Leonardo delivered this image to me because the technology of those ubiquitous APIs that allow us to talk to each other quickly, safely, and cheaply system to system has been maturing for the last 15 years. And actually that's what I wanna to talk to you about because from a, the point of view of you consuming services, the fact that I'm talking about technology that is cheaper and faster might not be something you're experiencing but fundamentally, digital technologies are a lot cheaper. And they're a lot cheaper if you do them right. They're a lot cheaper for a couple of reasons. The way we used to store information back when we had data centers, remember? That was extremely expensive. When I was at BNY Mellon, there used to be a no-fly zone for the American Air Force and um, commercial airlines over the data centers of BNY Mellon. I think you were in Kentucky. Can you imagine how big that is? how expensive that is. The equivalent storage of data in the cloud has different security provisions, but it's actually a lot cheaper. You don't need to know what an API first cloud native microservice architecture is. If you need to understand what it does for you, pay the UK Fin guys to help you understand your levers. What you need to understand though, because you're decision makers with budget to spend, is that your providers need to have understood how an API first cloud native microservice architecture will make their service cheaper for you. I would challenge to say that most of the providers out there haven't quite done that yet and I'll get to it. But any service provider that tells you that cloud native will automatically be cheaper. They will also automatically be much more flexible because customization and real-time communication is baked into what the technology is there for. It's magical. You don't need to bend it to your will. 
it was designed to do that. Customization is part of what APIs are there to do. Have you ever had this weird and freaky thing that your smartphone sends you a notification saying you have a meeting in your diary in an hour? And if you use your usual mode of transportation, it will take you 45 minutes to get there. You didn't ask it to do that, and you're definitely not paying for that service. But the APIs of your calendar, your geolocation, your uh, map, app, and probably whatever um, uh, tracker you have on your uh, credit card, talk to each other, and that's what APIs are there to do. Now, I know that's quite freaky if you haven't authorized it. And the first time my phone told me I had to leave because I would be late for a meeting I hadn't asked it its opinion on, even though I know what I know, it was a little unsettling. But from a point of view of paying for technology, you need to come to the table knowing that digital capabilities built correctly are cheaper. That personalization and flexibility is what they do. It's not a perk that your vendor will design for you. And all of that is done at a lower cost for the person building their technology. Exactly because you're on the cloud, you don't have those huge data centers, and you can scale usage up and down and only pay for what you need. Now, you're probably sitting there going, that's not my lived reality. That's not what it feels like when I'm consuming technology services, either from a vendor or inside my organization. And I would say, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. It doesn't feel that way. And this futuristic image I described isn't actually exactly what is happening inside most vendors. What is happening inside most vendors is a little bit of the jumble you're seeing in front of you right now. Most suppliers are not architected like that. And there's a good reason for them. Most of them date back to a pre-digital era. And as they started adding things and trying new things, they didn't necessarily scrap the old stuff. So they're carrying the big tin technology, the mainframes that Karen talked about, the technology that was designed in a different era and it's designed to do different things. It's designed to hold information not share it. It's designed to only make calculations at the end of the day, not during the course of the day. So as they try to add the digital stuff I was talking about on top, they created a jumble. They created a little bit of the monster that you see on the picture. They created an outcome that is less than the sum of its parts. It's slower because you have systems from different eras trying to talk to each other. It's heavier it's more prone to breakage because those systems were not meant to do similar things and we're forcing them to do something that they were not designed for. And it's a lot more expensive because you're holding on to pieces from different parts of history. So if your experience of digital services doesn't chime with what I was saying, it doesn't feel cheaper, it doesn't feel easier, could it be because your provider has not actually kept up with the program, that your provider has added all that nice shiny stuff on top of the old stuff. They're carrying the complexity, they're carrying the cost, and you're paying for it. Because that's how it goes. When a supplier carries complexity, we tend to pass it on to our customers. So if everything I described about digital experiences doesn't resonate, the reason is most probably the fact that your technology provider hasn't actually sanitized their estate. That is expensive and dangerous. And it's expensive and dangerous for reasons that even if you're not technical, you will understand. If something is designed to hold information and you're forcing it to release that information, you're going against the grain of the technology. You're asking it to solve a problem it wasn't designed for. That makes it brittle, that makes it fragile, that makes it unstable. It also makes it harder and more expensive to maintain because if it keeps breaking, you need to keep patching it. The more patches it has, the more likely it is to break. So you end up inside either a big bank that has proprietary technology or a small bank that has proprietary technology or a vendor that has legacy technology. You spend 80% of your time thinking about how the stuff you shouldn't have anymore will be kept from breaking, which also costs money. The footprint of your cost goes up your operating risk goes up. And as Karen pointed out, some of these legacy technologies, some of these legacy languages are not taught anymore. And there are situations where the health of people who have long retired is being tracked in risk committees 
Because if they die, there is no one left who knows how to patch a system. How is that a sensible way to behave? And yet that is what's happening in big organizations and across software providers that are over a certain age that are working with those big banks. Now, as a result, at the macro level, most of the industry looks like a museum. I have worked with organizations that have systems that date back to the early 70s. I once worked with an organization in a different geography, very large systemic bank that had a, a customer master that dated back to 1958. Now, the reality is only a lunatic would try to balance a digital capability on top of that, but that is exactly what is happening. And it has been happening cumulatively for decades. So if you're a big vendor or a big bank and you have accumulated museum pieces and you have balanced new technology on top of it, of course, everything I talked about, about speed and cost doesn't apply. And of course, you're scared to remove a piece because the risk of the stability and operational viability of what you created is huge. The risk of migrating something from a 1958 system to a 2023 system is huge. The reasons why big vendors and big FS institutions fear change are valid, but they do not apply to you. Those risks do not apply to you the same way. You don't have as much proprietary technology. You're not as wed to those vendors as they'd like to think. And your migration, such as they are, would be a lot simpler because you don't have the multi-jurisdiction, multi-exposure, and, and I'm more than happy to pick that up um, offline. All I want to say is the reasons why everyone else is stuck with this problem do not apply to you. And that should be liberating. You should not be beholden to this legacy. If you remember the conversation we started, most of it isn't working all that well. Most of it isn't fit for purpose. So you're bound to the constraints of particular technologies not developed for you, the terrible choices they may have made to create a heavy and expensive and cumbersome solution that wasn't created for you, and what for? Now, I need to disclose that I am not entirely biased. I work with the fantastic Encrypto team as an advisor. So I obviously think there is an alternative out there. But we are not the only ones, right? There are technology providers out there who are not solving the problem of a JP Morgan and trying to cut it down to size for you. So why are you not saying those problems are not my problems more? Who are the providers who are actually better at using the best of the technological cornucopia to solve your problems, not the problems of a giant and then give you a skinny version of that? There is undoubtedly a risk register that has to be followed and understood when you're thinking about te changing technology suppliers, changing technology disciplines. But the reality is what's holding the big boys back is not your problem. Of course, you have to manage certain risks, but they're not as crippling because you're not getting the same value and you don't have the same complexity. So if you want to start thinking differently about what the technology revolution we're living through can do for you, how can you get the upside that I described at the beginning, that speedy and cheaper personalization? I want to play too, right? How do I get that? One of the fundamental things you need to do is actually bring your CFO into the mix. You need to start getting into the discipline of not paying for the things you don't need. If you don't need it, you shouldn't carry it because it adds complexity and operating costs and you shouldn't pay for it. That means I would like you to become a more opinionated buyer. That doesn't mean a more technically savvy buyer. You don't need to understand what a microservice architecture is, but you can work with people in this movement, with the researchers that both the Sorota Center have and Karen talked about, with your peers, to understand what this best-in-class technology should be doing. I don't need you to go in there knowing what containerization does. You shouldn't have to, but you should get yourself to a place where you know what to expect to know where the bar should be, because those technologies I was speaking about 
are not as new as AI. You're using them every time you order an Uber. You're using them every time you order something from Amazon. So if you start understanding what you should expect from your vendors, you start having a different discussion. And if they tell you we can't do that, you know the answer is because they haven't invested in their technology, not because it can't be done. Now, this is where usually credit unions tell me we're small. The vendors won't change the way they operate for us. I would say each of you may be small, but you are legion and you are connected as a movement united in purpose. So I would challenge you to think more about your bargaining power as a collective. That doesn't mean you should all use the same technology, but if you start showing up as a movement to, techno to, to technology conversations about your needs, that collective bargaining all of a sudden makes you a much more powerful buyer. Because if you're paying for more than you're using, you're not just accepting the cost of doing business, you're hurting your mission. Because imagine a world where you only pay for what you need, a world where the digital capabilities that I talked about that are cheaper and more flexible and easier to personalize was the reality of your operation. Your total cost of ownership would go down, which means that your operating costs will go down, your CFO will love me. But what else happens when your cost to serve goes down? The loans get cheaper. And if you're mission driven, cheaper loans mean more loans. At a time where people are hungry and they're being turned down by banks whose technology footprint is too expensive and their cost of service through the roof and they don't care to address this problem. If you keep an eagle eye on your cost of serve, you're, you're enabling yourself to give more loans, cheaper loans, affordable loans to those who need them the most. I feel a warmth in my heart when I speak to credit unions and when I work with the Incuto team that I have never experienced in 20 years of being a banker. You guys make me feel less guilty about my life choices. But think about if the key to extending that table that invites people to come out of the cold and sit down and have that hand up and that help that the credit union movement gives through access. Imagine if the answer to doing more of that was actually under the hood of your IT infrastructure and spend, because I firmly and unequivocally believe it is. It absolutely is. So as a challenge and a mission, these are the things I'd like you to think about. Manage your cost to serve. Incidentally, big organizations are terrible at that because there is so much complexity in how cost is recorded that most big banks do not know what it costs them to service a loan, a credit card, an account. They do not know. They have a view, but those numbers are so blended and so heavily caveated that they don't actually know that number. You should be able to get that number. And as you start understanding and managing that cost to serve, start being more opinionated in how you negotiate with your vendors. Expect them to be part of the solution. Expect technology to be how you give more loans, cheaper loans, Expect your technology and your vendors to partner with you in succeeding in your mission because we need that mission more than ever right now with everything that's happening in the world. And use your voice as a movement. Each of you individually may not be the biggest buyer any of these vendors will deal with. Even the biggest ones of you will not be. But collectively, you represent a huge part of the financial services sector. You represent a huge and not so complicated to serve sector and one that would actually help with the ESG credentials so people should be listening and they will listen if you start coming to the table with a much more aggressive outlook on your numbers higher expectations from your vendors and above all together thank you so so much for your attention and again I am so sorry I'm not there I have something like five minutes for questions if you have any Lida would have been on the panel, but we're um, because she can't be here, we're going to um, take a few questions from the floor, if there are any. Has anyone got a question for Lida? We'll bring a mic to you. Uh, there's no, right, tumbleweed moment. Um, okay, okay, we've got a question here. Not sure it's actually a question or whether I formulated it yet, um, but a lot of what leaders just said to us went straight over my head. Uh, and I'm not sure how to formulate the question. 
So I think my question is, how do we uh, engage with people like yourself, Nick, or Lida, or Karen, to help us formulate the question as to what we want? Because I think that's the, the bit I'm unsure about at the moment. I love that question. And I was I was a little worried that might happen and I was hoping someone would say what you just said. And I guess my my urge is there's a lot here to learn and you don't need to learn it. So the the thing you said is a hundred percent the right problem statement. I shouldn't have you shouldn't have to understand what happens in the box, but you need to start formulating the questions of what your expectations should be. And what I try to point to is that the art of the possible has matured. You do not need to be a technologist, but you need to come to the table knowing I know what outcomes I want. So my my suggestion to you would be reach out to me, reach out to Karen, reach out to, to Nick and his team to work out exactly that. For me, the questions you should formulate are these are the things I know are possible, therefore I expect them. And these are the business metrics I will want you, Mr. Vendor, to meet. And it will be things like speed and personalization should not come at a premium. It should be things like your cost to serve should be so low because if you're not paying for things you don't need, you're actually going to have a very clean operating model. So you will come in with knowledge of your business knowledge of your own business levers because you understand how you underwrite alone you understand all those mechanics and the piece you're missing is not the technology understanding but working with someone like myself or karen her team nick uh, so reach out is what i'm saying to understand what that technology can do for you so next time you're negotiating with a vendor you say i, I don't care how you architected it does it do these three things can i have slas against these three things and as you start shifting the conversation, you'll be able to control it better because you'll be talking a language you understand and you'll put pressure on the vendors to actually measure themselves against something that you value. And I'm more than happy to help on that journey. Thanks, Lida. And that, may, <clears throat> that makes me think that this is potentially is something that, that, that Swoboda can do just because I think the, the discussion that you uh, are talking about there, Lida, with, with vendors is, is, is also the discussion that so, as Tony is a director of a credit... As, that credit union boards need to be able to have. And potentially, there are boards that don't feel equipped to have that conversation, or there are members of those boards who don't feel to equipped to have that conversation. So maybe there's something we can do, uh, and lead, it sounds great that leaders offering some help here, to, you know, it's, uh, it's the technological equivalent of the finance for non-financial managers course, you know? What is it, not, not getting into the nuts and bolts, but how do we talk about this stuff in a business way? How can we articulate our needs? Yeah. And I should say, and Lida, you can't, you can't see this, but, um, but there, are, there are several vendors, there are people in this room who would love to tell you that leaders, a, probably tell you that leaders wrong and that they are absolutely tailored to your needs. Um, and also that they, you know, they would like to help you understand your technological needs. So, um, you know, find, the, find those people, check out name badges at, at, uh, at the lunch break and that kind of thing. 100% there are some people, and as I said, I unashamedly plug the team I am affiliated to because, frankly, I like what they do and I believe in it. That's why I joined the advisory board. But we're not alone. There are people who are tailored to your needs. But I would still, I still see credit unions who go with the comfort of a bigger name vendor, and they're not. They're absolutely not. And if you have some of those in the room, sorry, guys, but I'm not wrong. Um, but I, I agree with what Nick is saying. We, we collectively have a responsibility to help here, to help the boards understand what they're asking for, what they should be asking for. And there will be vendors in the room who are willing to help you. So yes, look at the name tags and talk to them and, and reach out to us. And we will help. Because if we change the conversation, we will raise the bar. That's a great phrase. I shall, I shall put that at the top of one of our reports. Um, we'll change the conversation. We'll raise the bar. Brilliant. Has anyone else got a, a question for Lida? Um, if, we ha if we had you here, Lida, I would, I would want to get into that debate around, um, you know, that tech is cheaper and nimbler and more flexible um, when we are always hearing about scale. Scale, scale, scale. And um, uh, Swoboda members, uh, some Swoboda members gathered for a dinner last night um, and heard from uh, George Hofheimer, who's going to be speaking to us this afternoon. And George was talking about what's going on in the States. And of course, the numbers in the States, as many of you know, are mind-boggling from our perspective on this side of the Atlantic. But it is still 
uh, even now, still um, a trend towards merge, merger for scale. And so, and I assume that it's economics or a perceived set of economics that's driving that. Um, so that would seem to suggest that you know that 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 the uh, that tech isn't getting cheaper, leader. Do you want to? Do well, you want to that's because that they more? haven't. Can I can I take you back to that museum image? Yeah. The tech won't get cheaper if you don't shed the old expensive tech. So when people tell you that the tech isn't getting cheaper, challenge them to tell you how much technology they have that is older than ten years. How many different languages they're maintaining? Do they still have COBOL based technology? Do they have a mainframe lurking somewhere in the mix? I would challenge anyone who says the tech is getting cheaper to confess and own up to what museum piece they're carrying. That's number one. The second piece is knowledge. There is a very active management of your scalability on the cloud. There are engineers whose job is to create efficiency for scale. The more you do on cloud, the cheaper it gets. But you need to know the right things to do it. And again, big vendors, big uh, banks tend to get emotional about who they appoint, appoint to these big jobs. They want to reward someone for loyalty and they put them in a role they don't understand. Again, these are not constraints you should have as a as a um, credit union movement. So I would challenge anyone who says the tech isn't getting cheaper to tell us who's managing their scalability and you'd find a talent and knowledge gap and how many museum pieces they're carrying and you'll find at least one. Okay, thank you. The, <clears throat> and that's a discussion I think that will run and run for probably another hundred years. So um, I think, uh, thank you ever so much, Leader. We're going to move into our panel now. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us on the line. A uh, big round of applause for Leader. And we'll... So just let me briefly uh, introduce um, our panel, uh, and then I'm going to give um, uh, two of them an opportunity. Karen's already given you uh, some of her thoughts to make a start. Um, so uh, we're going to, I'll just briefly introduce, they'll say a few words and then it'll be over to you. I'm looking to uh, this group of people with minds fizzing to have some questions for our experts. So um, in addition to Karen, we have Andrea Lanya is joining us from Alliance Manchester Business School um, at very short notice. So thank you, Andrea. Um, and Andrea is a, uh, an assistant professor of fintech uh, at the uh, Alliance Manchester Business School and was previously at the University of Loughborough and I think did a sexy stint in San Diego or somewhere earlier this year, was it? Yeah, yeah. so, um, so uh, Andrea, and Andrea has a big interest in the sort of social aspects of finance. Um, and Paul Rooney, uh, some of you may know Paul as a consultant to the sector. Uh, he's director of Constituent, uh, which is an advisory firm that um, offers strategy, governance, and, and technology advice. So, um, and you've already met Karen. So three different perspectives to bring to the problems and challenges that we're facing are around digital, around technology, around the future. Can I just give, um, I'll start with Andrea, if you could just give us a couple of minutes, Andrea, of your sort of thoughts and perspectives, might be about what we've heard this morning, or it just might be your thoughts on this world. Sure. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Nick. Uh, it's a great opportunity, and I'm really happy. Uh, Yeah, as I said, I'm really happy to be here. Great to be in Manchester. I just moved, and uh, it's a great city. And okay. The fintech ecosystem is amazing. So, um, yeah, well, a lot of food for thought. Um, well, I would like to start with quite of a controversial, maybe might be a controversial question. What's the problem with COBOL? I mean, it's, it's a very stable language, and, uh, and mainframe computers are, are, are great. They're, you know, the, the, the infrastructure that underpins most of the financial, uh, financial services industry. So I don't actually see why uh, we have to criticize uh, mainframe computers, well, supercomputers today, and, uh, and COBOL is a language. So that was my first, um, first question that I would like to, yeah, the microphone's um, on, um, to share with you. It's not loud enough. What? Hey, Nick. I can hear you on the back. Are we recording the data and we can use some machine learning to, you know, <laughs> make some prediction of what we could, what Nick is doing? <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, that's the uh, that's my first uh, you know some kind of like a curiosity that I have um, surrounding um, um, financial infrastructures and the role that COBOL has been played since the late 90, uh, 1950s. Um, the second aspect has to do with uh, with business strategy, and. Um, I'm not an expert on credit unions at all, but what I've seen in the, the presentations, that the fantastic presentation that Karen and Leda gave, there's so much emphasis on, uh, on uh, the community and so much emphasis on uh, inclusion. Now, I'm, uh, I wrote a paper on financial inclusion, fintech and financial inclusion in emerging markets. And I'm more, more increasingly curious about knowing more um, about financial inclusion in advanced economies and especially what role credit unions can play uh, within uh, this agenda. The financial inclusion agenda is, is huge and uh, the IMF and the World Bank uh, they, and, 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 and a, a, a huge range of uh, um, uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations are all involved in Tohet. Uh, um, around the world there are like currently 1.4 billion people who are uh, unbanked and most of these people are in uh, are um, in developing countries, but um, it's very interesting to uh, to see what's happening in the space in the space of financial inclusion in advanced economies and the role that credit unions can play uh, in it. And what what I found very interesting in um, Karen's presentation was the uh, the focus on uh, um, digital inclusion. It's almost like financial inclusion in uh, advanced economies needs to be grounded on uh, digital inclusion. So it's digital inclusion first, and then we can build financial inclusion. It's, it's, it's so fascinating what, what you were saying about the inability to access um, uh, financial services if for whatever reason, can be cultural, can be related to a disability. Um, I, I know people uh, who don't feel, um, don't like to, to use the ATM machine because uh, they're afraid that once they leave the cash machine, the ATM is going to spit out all the money <laughs> that, that, you know, that they have in the, in the, in the bank. So you know, the issue of digital inclusion is very important and credit unions can play um, a, a big role into it. Um, so about that, there's the issue of business strategy and, um, and I'm always quite uh, keen of studies that um, in organization theory and business and management studies, we call it hybrid organizing. And uh, credit unions that seem to, uh, to be quite exposed to this um, hybrid um, um, hybridity, let's call it like this. So there have been a lot of studies on microfinance and how they managed this, um, um, these twin identities. And the two identities are mainly a socially oriented one and a, a commercial oriented one. So. Um, what I would like to invite credit unions to do is make sure that you don't lose that community focused, uh, that mission uh, that is so important. Um, and, and, and we gotta work so hard in the overall business environment, including um, uh, customers, including partners, including policy makers and regulators, making sure that, um, in this case, credit unions, um, as they uh, evolve uh, along this path of digital transformation, don't lose that mission. And I found that to be really important. And in academia, we call it mission drift. So we have to make sure that uh, that, um, that mission um, is that we don't drift away from that important mission of serving the communities and, and moving away towards something else that uh, is not um, uh, community focused anymore. And then what I found very interesting in uh, Karen's presentation is also the, uh, the focus on, and Leda particularly as well, uh, the focus on the digital artifacts and how they're, um, they're developed. Um, there are a lot of studies about financial fintech and financial inclusion that show that um, the, the technology uh, wasn't developed with the unbanked in mind. Um, while there are also more recent studies that show that, um, for instance, uh, there's a case of a um, remittance provider, a newcomer in the space, uh, that developed the, uh, the app by keeping the, taking, keeping the unbanked, uh, having the unbanked in mind. For instance, it was just about um, as simple as adding uh, the possibility to, uh, for the beneficiaries, in this case developing countries, to receive money through mobile money accounts uh, like M-Pesa. Um, so sometimes it's very simple and there are many studies that show that uh, the digital artifact has to be um, uh, designed 
um, in academic uh, jargon is called technology appropriation. So um, they have to be designed in a way that uh, the users can appropriate uh, that, uh, that technology. Um, uh, yeah, um, that's it for me now. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I took too long maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. I had to abandon the, uh, the lapel mic because apparently that's I interfering. So, Paul, yes, give us your little manifesto and then, then we'll open it up to the floor for some questions. I'm just going to test the room. Does anyone remember Naked Gun 2? When the mic... Yeah, that's, I did worry, Nick, at one point. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to, to join the, the panel. I think we've had some excellent contributions already and I will touch on some of those points, but actually maybe take us in a slightly different direction uh, as well. I established uh, Constituent back in 2018 and it was with the purpose of supporting social enterprises like credit unions on the digital journey. Um, I started my career as a lawyer, uh, I then moved on to politics and I thought why not be a consultant and you know really you know become unpopular. Um, but I actually been invited into the credit union sector, what I was able to actually see is that there was a disconnect between the, the vendors, the suppliers and actually the credit unions themselves. I think the gentleman in the front asked a really valid question at the end is how do we actually take back that control by being informed and asking the right questions? And I think the credit union sector in terms of technology is on the journey and what we try and do in constituent is to break it down, simplify it, making sure that we empower the business leaders inside credit unions to ask the, the right questions and hopefully identify the available technology. We follow a methodology, it's people, processes, technology, and the key thing to emphasize is it has to be in that order. You know, Karen mentioned right at the start that people are at the heart of everything you do as credit unions, but also everything you should be doing in terms of digitization. It's really important to know what your members are looking for from the technology. Going back to, to Nick's opening comments, I think we're further forward than actually, you know, waiting two or three years. I think you've got credit unions in this room that can tell the story of what they are serving to their members and that 24-7 uh, service that their members are looking for and they are desperately uh, seeking ways to provide that. But that's where the problem comes in, is that a lot of the systems at the moment are still clunky. The first credit I would pay is that we have some fantastic fintechs in the sector now, and some have been mentioned already, there are some in the room uh, that I can see, and they have done a phenomenal job. Because of the, the complexities and the limitations of legacy systems, core platforms, we have had wrapper solutions that have came uh, and successfully deployed into our credit unions across the UK. Uh, they are actually providing some of that functionality which allows um, the 24-7 experience that we're, we're talking about. But is that satisfactory going forward? Does that engineer ways of working that doesn't actually always refine the processes? And that's why you know, the work that we do is to try and make sure that you get the best outcome. So that starting point of knowing what the wants and needs are of your members allows you then to identify what the available technology is. Now, I've, I've paid the, the positive there, that the fintechs are there, they're developing components out, but that still goes back to the original question that I remember Fairfield Finance raising when they assessed the, the market, the credit union sector in the UK, and at that point, 37%, and this is, I believe, going back to 2020, 37% of credit unions in the UK were looking to move core platform provider. Now, my research shows that that has grown substantially, if not doubled, which means many in the room at the moment are not satisfied with their core platform. And I think part of the reason there has been a limitation in terms of investment in such platforms. And as you've heard, some of the platforms that you're actually relying upon are decades old. And because of the, the relationship with the vendor, it does sometimes mean that you do not get the choice that you're looking for. You do not have control. So some of the great fintechs I mentioned have to actually work really hard behind the scenes to establish relationships in order to provide the services that you're looking for, and more importantly, that your members are looking for. So what I would say is that we have to obviously establish those relationships the right way, empowering you to actually ask those questions, but you can't do it unless the technology comes forward. So I'm going to end on the positive. The positive is the technology is coming. Now, I think there is questions and a discussion to be had around costs because some t technology platforms at the moment are very cheap. You know, they aren't, it isn't going to be the case for everyone that you can actually 
get access to the technology you're looking for within the existing budget. So I'd maybe give a counter view to that is that some of you will have to pay more for the technology. But actually, when you look at some of the new platforms that are coming forward, they are all coming forward with the right development. They're coming forward based around the wants and needs of credit unions, not of banking platforms that are retrofitted into the sector. It's based around what you're actually looking for. I think there's a, a range of, of options that I can see are coming forward. You've got those that are operating elsewhere in financial services, where choice is given, who are then looking to come into the sector and serve you. I think that's to be warmly welcomed. I also recognise as well that some credit unions in the UK have invested a lot in their own technology, and there's some in the room that can tell that story and will tell that story today, and those are to be commended as well. And there's those that are actually starting to build out their own platforms that could become available. And the key thing here is that it's choice. That's what you're looking for. You need to take control of your technology, because at the end of the day, as Andrea said, it goes back to your business strategy. The technology is only the enabler for you then to deliver what you're looking for for your, for your members. And of course, it's not just the members just now, it's your future members. I think just to, to think back to maybe 2017, I wrote a blog about Alexa back then. Now, that would have been a different discussion back in 2017. I think we're very aware as a sector of what we are looking for now. And I suppose one question, just to go back to, to Leader's point around risk, I think we need to learn from the mistakes of the past. Technology only takes you so far. This is about transformational change. This is about organisational change. And we need to acknowledge what the risks are. So therefore, we need to be prepared. I think if we actually get too carried away with the technology, sometimes we forget about the business processes, we forget about the people in the business, and we need to take everyone on a journey. So my last, I suppose, caveat at this point, Nick, is to, to bear in mind technology is only the enabler. The bigger picture is obviously the business change. Thanks, Paul. Great. So this is, our, this is your panel. Well, who's, has anyone got a question for them? Because I've, I've got one, but I would like you guys to go first. We've got a microphone, we've got a microphone up there. So who's got a question for our panel? Yeah, we've got one in the middle here. Chris. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, a few of you mentioned about um, mission and community and so on. And um, part of the, one of the downsides I think of the digital journey is, is about losing connection with members and being able to fulfill that side of our mission as community cooperatives. So in my credit union, for example, I'd say probably about 5% of our members interact with us in the old fashioned ways, face to face or telephone. 95% of them, it's digital access, 24 seven digital communication. That means we've created a, a large gap between us and our members and our ability to function as a cooperative. And I'm wondering how we can use technology to fill, to fill some of that gap and use it for, um, for those purposes as opposed to providing services. So I, I also sit on an advisory group around impact for um, a company called We Are Group. And they're building platforms just like that so that you can service while still having like the human in the loop. So when people need you, you can respond and fulfill that hybrid. I think, think back to your point, what, what is wrong with COBOL? There's nothing wrong with COBOL. It's just the people are dying who actually know the language. Um, and we're not teaching it. So if we're not teaching it in universities, then it will die. And this is not the criticism of the actual infrastructure itself. Like you say, it's solid, but again, it, it's, it's 40, 50 years old. So then if you try, as Lida said, and build something on top of that, you, you're not going to get you're going to get something fragmented, something that's clunky. Like she said, it doesn't work. And also when you're talking about M-Pesa and, and Africa and India, yes, but they're also further ahead on getting a, a recognized digital identity in place that you can pass the regulators here with the FCA to say that you know your customer and that you're actually responsibly lending. And we, we I, I was talking to the FCA the other day and saying around consumer duty, you know, that there's lots of of pain points around that as well in serving serving the communities. How 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 do you serve someone who doesn't meet KYC? What what where are you doing around digital identity? So they're doing a new call next year around financial inclusion that'll be coming out soon to to look at these pain points. But back to your point, 
there are there are companies like we are group who are looking again they've got a they've got a huge committee there's about 45 of us sitting on giving diverse points about how you can merge the digital with the physical but not lose who you are as a company and this is, this is back to your point so there are there are options out there but again this, this is a journey for everyone, and an organization to me is just a, a group of people. You don't have an organization unless you've got people, and the process and the strategy is just a piece of paper until it's owned by the people who are delivering it. So it always comes back to me for, for people, and the tech is definitely just the enabler. Finding your way through it, I think, is back to this gentleman's point here. Tony, Tony is it? Yeah, Tony's point. That... Um, we need to uh, try and help you understand the questions you'd be asking and give you this. Like I say, with the FinTech network, the UK Fin network, we, we can actually pull in people who can help you go, this is, this is what I want to solve. How do we solve it collectively? Because I don't know. Um, and this is what we want to have today to challenge you to say, there are people you can reach out who can help you through that journey so that you are still serving your customer because that's why the credit unions exist in my opinion. So there are solutions out there, there are people working on it, and I'm sure they'd like to hear from more credit unions about what they're doing in their platforms anyway. Anyone else want to have a bite at that one? Yeah, I, I would just say it actually goes back to serving the member the way that the member wants to be served. I, I recognise that we all talk about digitalisation as being removing ourselves, but actually, you know, I've seen examples in the sector in the UK where they've used communication tools to actually get closer to members, you know, we're, we're surrounded by technology in our life. COVID was a big factor in terms of how we behave. So actually looking at some of the tools, we now actually probably gravitate to WhatsApp as one of the main communication tools. Does that mean we have not got a close relationship with our credit union? I would probably argue for those members, actually, they, they may feel closer. But I'll also recognise that everyone's different at different stages. So whilst I like maybe a, a digital service, there's times when I want to speak to someone. And where the technology should help credit unions in the UK is actually free up time to spend with those members who are actually looking for that face-to-face -face or over a telephone uh, relationship, which at the moment is the biggest struggle because there's a lot of manual interventions, um, a lot of kind of processes that unfortunately you, technology should be able to replace going forward, but at the moment is not, means that that time you're spending with members is probably limited in, in the experience of many credit unions. So I think probably the technology will allow you to get even closer going forward rather than actually be further away. Um, yeah, very briefly. Um, yeah, there's, there's a tension between online and offline. And, um, and one of my co-authors uh, wrote a, a very beautiful study about um, peer-to-peer -peer lender uh, micro-lending in uh, India. And um, so it's micro-lending, of course. Uh, but from the study, it was evident how uh, this micro-lender um, was so successful in managing the online and offline tension, uh, making sure that uh, the online presence uh, was there and it attracted uh, plenty of investors. And um, even from a vantage point of uh, the aesthetics of the platform, and there are many studies in uh, organization theory about uh, the digital aesthetics, for instance, and to create uh, um, a sense of empathy. Literally here we're going down uh, the, the route of semiotics, <laughs> like how to use semiotics to, and, you know, to uh, use different colors, uh, different pictures. Um, so that, um, in, by using those techniques, um, um, the, um, this micro lender was successful in uh, creating a sense of empathy between investors and borrowers. At the same time, they were um, really careful in managing the offline presence, in this case, um, making sure that they have uh, uh, really good contact with citizens' uh, organizations uh, on the ground, like literally uh, that they were able to identify uh, the borrowers who truly needed uh, money. And so uh, obviously this doesn't um, concern uh, credit unions that much, but still the, um, the main lesson that I draw from that ex micro lending platform experience is how successfully they manage the uh, offline and online presence. And I think there is a way to uh, use technology at, at, um, to um, um, uh, build that sense of community. I'm not sure where the chatbots are, <laughs> are, are the way to go, to be honest. <laughs> um, but. Um, yeah, definitely, like, you know, more use of WhatsApp, why not, <laughs> for sure. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. So are there any more questions? You snooze, you lose, because I'm going to jump in. Oh, there, Matt's got one, good. 
Um, <coughs> hi everyone, I'm Matt Bland from the Co-op Credit Union. Um, I'm wondering, like many people I think, about um, AI and how that is likely to affect um, society in general and how we deliver services. Um, and some of the stuff in the press around, you know, the, the concerns of people working in and on AI technology about, you know, the kind of, uh, you mentioned, Karen, I think, the, the kind of Skynet, Terminator kind of future um, where we're having a war with these things that we've created. You know, and I, I, like many people, spent a lot of my youth wasting, uh, you know, hours watching these films and books and so on. So slightly concerning that that might be where we go. But <coughs> I also... You know, there's this recent story about Sam Altman and he's been sacked and now, now he's not sacked and the board's gone. And I'm wondering what does that, what's going on at the heart of AI in terms of the power and control of this technology and should be we worried? Um, and, you know, I'd just be interested in your reflections on all of that. Well, we're back to people, right? Because you just, you just put it in there. It, it's about an argument of who's got the power over where the next, the next technological you know, insight will come from. As I said, we, we get to learn about these a year down the line. Like Google, I say Google just announced when we were starting to look at multimodal AI, Google then just announced they've been working on this for a year but never told anybody. So y the, the Terminator days are a long way off unless they're working on something that we don't know. And this is, this is the problem that y you, where we're at right now, AI is not sentient. It cannot think empathetically like a human, it cannot make decisions beyond what it is programmed and trained to do. What generative AI do is, is, is grab a lot of information and build a story around the prompts that you put in. How you use those prompts is a human decision at the moment. The AI is just, is just grabbing information around keywords, learning to look for those keywords as a massive data set, which is what it's really good at doing, very efficiently, very quickly, much quicker than a human can do. That's why it speeds up your processing because it can, it can be trained. Phenomenal use cases, like you say, in medicine, in finance, etc. But at the moment, the answer is it's an unknown unknown. Um, what people are doing in developmental behind closed doors in Silicon Valley, we, we don't have access to. What people like Altman are trying to do is say there are some concerns that we need to have a human in the loop because we're not quite sure in developing this what it can potentially lead to. Will it r lead to, to um, Terminator? I, I personally don't think so. You get hype cycles all the time about different things and the, the discussion around the metaverse has gone really quiet. We're not talking about what's going on in, in that space either. So... It, at the moment, there is no definitive answer. Because like you say, these kind of discussions around Altman sacked, not sacked, has got to do with a power play, which is infinitely human, to have power over that technology and who gets to do what next. But the technology as it stands, um, working with computer scientists, cannot do what people think it can. It can only do what it's trained to do on that data and run wild and certain functionality on top of that, but it cannot replace a human being as yet. That's encouraging. Has anyone else got it? Do you want to comment on that? You want to? Want? Um, um, well, the history of AI, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very long one. Um, Skynet, uh, uh, you know, AGI, so artificial general intelligence, there are different definitions of that. And what's interesting is that the definition that everyone is thinking currently is that we can have, we can achieve AGI if we continue, or if we continue on this path of using um, um, a, a um, well, deep learning, for instance, and uh, using um, having like spread um, uh, generative AI everywhere. We're going to achieve um, AGI. Well, uh, very few people go back and think about you know lessons by um, you know put forward by uh, John Searle, philosopher, or um, uh, Hubert Drefu, another philosopher from Berkeley. Um, uh, they have a very specific definition of what artificial general intelligence will be, and it's uh, Searle call it strong AI, um, and it has to do with um, um, having self-reflection and consciousness. The thing is that at the moment we don't even know why our neurons. Um, create consciousness, so it's going to be pretty difficult to, to, to understand um, how from a, a widespread uh, use of machine learning 
um, somehow these machines can be um, yeah, sentient or it can be self-reflective uh, and can have consciousness. So I think very few people are really you know, trying to uh, study what Drefu and, and, and Searle uh, were talking about uh, in the 70s and, and the 80s. Um, well, what's interesting about um, AI and, and its application to financial services industry is that the first results weren't that great back in the 80s when expert, um, a certain type of AI called expert uh, systems uh, were developed back then. And, um, you know, banks, they started buying uh, Lisp machines, which were these machines that coded systems back then, and uh, they just didn't work. They, you know, the, these AI systems couldn't, be, uh, up, couldn't get up to speed with uh, uh, the needs of the financial industry. Um, yeah, they're not going to be sentient. Uh, I think what I, what I found quite risky is what um, um, a computer scientist, Michael Wooldridge uh, from uh, Oxford, who wrote a, an amazing book called, uh, I think, The Road to Conscious Machines. Uh, it's a very popular history of AI. He said, look, uh, um, honestly, um, AGI, and that's the title of one of the uh, sections, AGI is... Um, Actually, it mentions singularity, so Ray uh, Kurzweil's uh, idea of you know uh, the singularity. Singularity is bullshit, he said. So it's BS. Uh, what we should be worried about, we should remember this. After all, these uh, are AI systems, and they're computers, and computers are built on programs and uh, and hardware infrastructure, and they break down at some point. So we should be worried about these glitches. So. We should not be worried about AI being sentient, but we should be worried about um, 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 the glitches in the system. And it brings uh, bring us back to COBOL. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we should be worried about having another flash crash like it happened in May 2010 with high frequency trading. What was going to happen in, in the future now that you know machine learning uh, is widespread in uh, across the you know let's say the quantitative hedge fund world doesn't really concern credit unions, to be honest. But, um, but those glitches, yeah, they're, they're, they're potential um, uh, risk for uh, credit unions too. Paul, do you want to say, you, you can only say something if you keep us in a kind of positive mood oh. about the Terminator. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, I, um, I like comedy, Matt, you know, so uh, Terminator and the like's not really my genre. I, I would just obviously point maybe to, to more the modern day use of machine learning and, um, we're, we're seeing obviously the benefits in terms of the efficiency of processes. Um, I talked earlier on about the manual interventions that, that many of our teams have to do inside credit unions. And this is where I, I say the technology has already been deployed. I think some of the fintechs that are in the room can obviously speak in great detail. Uh, I'm not necessarily concerned about the world being taken over by robots quite yet, um, but I'll keep an eye out. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So, uh, with the seamlessness for which our conferences are famous, Paul, what's the time? <laughs> Ten to. Okay, well, I, I have a question now. Maybe I'll have come back to over lunch, because uh, I, I, I think we need to move, I think we move on. Or you, you, well, we've got five minutes, have we? Okay, so is there one more, is, there is a question up at the back. Peter. It's really, um, you know, we can have jokes about uh, Terminator and stuff, is on, is it? You can hear me, yeah. Um, but I think members, all members of credit unions will be concerned about security and, uh, and about privacy. And those are, I think, real and genuine concerns for everybody. Um, I'm a member, as you'll see from the grey hair, I'm a member of the USS Pension Fund, which was hacked recently. Somebody somewhere out there has got my bank account number and my national insurance number. Um, and I, I, I wonder, I worry a bit about whether or not we've got sufficient security in our systems. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, you, you haven't really answered or addressed um, in your, uh, you know, you, you've given a hard sell on technology, but the downsides of it, you haven't really looked at very carefully. And if I may just give a little bit of personal history on this. Um, back in 1972, when I was a young, idealistic individual, I was in a political organization, not, not a terrorist one, okay, not a terrorist one, um, but it was not liked by the establishment. As a result, my government gave my name and address and details right across NATO. And unfortunately, on my way back from Oz, I stopped off at, the, at Greece. Um, and it was the time of the Papadopoulos regime. Uh, and when they got me, they took me, two heavies took me downstairs to the cells where they can't hear the screams. It's, you, it's a very lonely feeling, actually. 
And the reason I'm still here and alive and not, and is because they didn't have a computer. Because back in 1972, all they had was a card index. And I was able to deny everything, which of course you do under those circumstances, as you might imagine. Um, so here I am. But today, they would have my photo, they'd have my details, they'd just press a button. And that, to me, is really scary. Never mind, don't have to worry about terminators. Just look at the control and the surveillance that IT has brought into our society already and the risks that it has to anybody who has a certainly a dissident perspective. And if I may say so, in this globalized world, credit union members, all the cooperators, are dissidents because we're saying that the capitalist system doesn't work that well. And I think, therefore, we need to be worried about the surveillance aspects and how we protect ourselves, not by pretending the technology doesn't exist, but by using the technology. And I'm interested in what we can do to do that. Thank you very much. OK, I I'll take that one, because um, I did put up a big risk assessment picture up there. And um, this was one of my first questions when I got involved in this area at Durham University. And you're quite right, but there is no th such thing as privacy. Let's just put it out there. It isn't. You have anything digital. Uh, as Lida said, they can track where you're using credit card. I mean, I travel quite a lot in the role, and it knows where I am. It knows exactly where I am and communicate that back to the bank. I remember, this is a pertinent question, because um, when, when I went to the gym in COVID, the, it, I was speaking to, to one of the workers there, and they said, you're a smart person, you do all this techie stuff. Is it true that in the vaccination, they stuck a microchip in it so they can track us all? And I went, you got a mobile phone? They went, yeah, I went, don't need to track you. They can track you via that. So that, that is the truth about privacy, but the security angle is very interesting. So when I mentioned CDR earlier, that is moving from corporate social responsibility to corporate digital responsibility. Okay, you go, well, what's the difference? The difference is it's about thinking before you even start designing something, what are the key questions you need to ask? Ethics by design for students and, and new computer scientists coming through about what you're doing with the data, where you got it from, what's the heritage, how can you get rid of as much bias as possible, but recognizing you can't get rid of all of it because it was created by humans and we're biased. Um, and then what are you going to do with that data? Who are you going to share it with? Where is it going to be secured? Is, it, is the cloud safe enough? Then you've got GDPR. You're not allowed the right to be forgotten. You know, you, you've got these different compliances coming in as well. And then you're going to build a digital technology as well. So this is what I said at the outset. It's about asking the critical questions because there is a risk. It was one of my first critical questions in speaking to computer scientists, OK? We go from the deep learning level, which, as Andrea said, is equivalent to the neural network in our brain. We don't understand it in behavioral psychology, we still don't understand it, how our synapse fully work. And so therefore, they don't fully understand the black box that you hear about. They still don't only fully understand it. But what they're trying to do is, is describe ways that they're making sure that it's as secure as possible. And that, that's what we live with. So in terms of security and privacy, Cybersecurity is one of the most sought after skills right now, because guess what? There's not enough taught about it. But CDR is like the human in the loop to say, what are you doing with the data and the subsequent digital technology that has an impact across the social, the economic, and the environmental, which is where the UN's ESG and SDGs come in, and has key questions for you to ask. If you want to check it out, it's corporatedigitalresponsibility.net. It's actually a global movement now. They produced a manifesto of what you should be looking at technological to ask yourself questions when you're using data and technology. And therefore, around your security and privacy, where is your security? How, how are you checking on that security and making sure that you are also compliant with GDPR or other such data restrictions depending on where you're operating? So security and privacy, though we might not have talked about it specifically here, um, is what comes under the CDR, which I sort of snuck in and said I'd speak about later. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, Peter, thank you for the question, because I think it's an excellent one. And, and for the, the background, obviously, from your own personal experiences, you, you meant, uh, you'll recall at the end I made reference to the risks about you know making sure that you've got organisational readiness. Part of that's definitely around the use of data. Hopefully what I said in, in my contribution obviously makes reference to the dangers of running towards the technology. 
And actually, you know, there's a couple of examples coming to my mind. Everyone remembers, obviously, Cambridge Analytica and, and how Facebook data was being used. And at that point, I felt, well, for the first time, Facebook's going to be exposed because it is just a marketing tool. Nothing more, nothing less. I mean, it's allowing you to comment, it's allowing you to share photographs, but really it's the data that they're using and profiting from. But of course, it didn't put anyone off. So, you know, the members that we are obviously looking to reach out to, they know the risks, as Karen has outlined, but they're still wanting the technology. So for you as the organization serving them, you have to be very clear. And that's the, the, the point that I would make around when you're, when you're dealing with a range of new vendors, all of them will want access to your data. All of them will look to use your data in a certain way. All of them will look for flexibility around your data. And if you want an example of it, this morning I actually read uh, a terms of a contract and flagged a question which is very uh, akin to what you've just mentioned there, Peter, is that, you know, that, that lack of clarity from the supplier of how the data would be used, I think, puts vulnerabilities on the credit union. Without reference to those terms and those details, I think it'd be very easy just to sign up to a pro forma. So my, my point is beware. Can we just be really quick, Karen, and then, and then if, uh, Andrew, do you want to jump in on this or not? Well, okay, so hold that, when, after Karen, we'll, oh, okay. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, experience and uh, I would like to take this opportunity to um, um, invite uh, Nick to organize a workshop about yeah. the credit unions in the age of surveillance capitalism, to quote the book by Harvard, by Shoshana Zuboff, who's the professor, Harvard Business School professor. So that would be a great way to discuss these issues. Yeah, I, 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 I was actually thinking that we absolutely will do something. We won't call it about surveillance capitalism, <laughs> if that's all right. It's a great time. Um, I'm, I, I may bring my picture of Engels, but we won't call it that. But, it, but the, the digital ethics question, and, and sorry, Karen, I will let you, you have the last yeah. word here. So, um, so we did research on this about privacy and security. And as you said, because people use data, and we're back to psychology again, if you want something, how many, how many of you read the full terms and conditions that you're asked around GDPR before your desire to read what's on the page? You've just clicked yes? Okay. And this is what we found out. It doesn't become important, back to your point, until it goes wrong. And then when it goes wrong, the credit unions will have someone come to you and go, you didn't, you didn't make sure my account was secure. You know, so what are you going to do? And this is, the, this is the human nature thing. We don't care about it because we want ease, ease of navigation when we are using digital. But we only care about it when it goes wrong. And, and surveillance capitalism is great because this is back to the point of Facebook, Gaffin, as you call them, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, that they are the puppet masters and we are the puppets, and that's what Zuboff's key point is. And then we get drawn into this digital contract because it's like the, the muffin. We don't want to miss out. So we don't want to miss out on something, so we throw away our data, but we only, then we're bothered about the data when it goes wrong, and then when that security and privacy comes in because we want somebody to hold accountable for that culpable in legal terms. Thank you. Sorry, Andrea. I'm going to, um, so uh, we're going to, we're going to uh, leave it there. We're going to, and we're going to, you guys are now going to have to work a bit harder, but can we say thank you very much to our panelists? Thank you.